it's difficult to know where to begin in talking about the youth movements of the late 1950s uh, through the 1970s. Uh, and it's also difficult to know how to break this up uh, because in doing so, we take a whole of things that influenced one another and for analytical purposes, we break those organic connections. Well, as difficult as that is to do, um, we still need to do it in order to understand the various components. But remember that the things that we'll talk about in the next three or four lectures actually influenced one another. Uh, that is, uh, the, the political radicalism of the time, the cultural uh, dissatisfaction of the time, the cultural radicalism of the time, uh, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, uh, the new left movement, the new right movement, all of, and, and prosperity and the end of prosperity, as well as the beginning of other liberation movements, not only in the U.S., but, but indeed throughout the world made the 1960s and 70s and the late 50s a tremendously um, um, important time for change in the 20th century. Um, there is supposed to be a Chinese proverb, that a, a curse actually, that says, may you live in interesting times. And the 20th century has certainly been interesting times. The, uh, the 1960s uh, are part of that. So knowing where to begin is a little bit difficult. Um, let me begin, however, by backing up just a little bit, continuing to talk about politics, by talking about the rise of the new left in the United States. Now, remember, this is just a survey, and so we won't go into any great depth in the new left, um, but it's a pretty important movement um, because it combined with the um, civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and got some real momentum uh, during the 1960s. Now, what's the background of both the, um, the new left and the new right, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later? Uh, the new right is more influential now than it was in the 1960s. Uh, and so we'll talk about the, the rise of the new right, which, which occurred during the 1960s, but in its impact, uh, connected with its impact uh, in the 1980s. Um, anyway, the background of, of the, the left, cultural radicalism, all of this, is that the baby boomers, uh, that, that large swelling of population, some of, some, some of you, if you're fairly young, will probably say baby boomer and then turn and spit. Um, we did that to our parents. I'm a boomer. We did that to our parents, and so I guess we've got it coming. But that's okay. Just go ahead and feel uh, uh, smug because your kids are going to do it to you. Um, but the baby boomers um, born beginning about 1945 through maybe 1964 when birth rates averaged over 4 million a year uh, in the United States and then dropped back down below 4 million, then began reaching activist age. The first of the boomers began reaching um, uh, young adulthood. Um, so they began feeling their oats, you might say, and they began searching for what they thought was the right life. Um, uh, many, many people at the time, and including some of the um, uh, parents of the boomers, some of the older brothers and sisters, uh, began searching for an authentic life. How do you live an authentic life in the midst of bureaucratized politics and a mass consumer culture? Um, and this was the thing that motivated uh, uh, many people. Also, we have to factor in the social ramifications of living in fear of nuclear annihilation. Remember, the baby boomers had, been, had grown up um, being told that they themselves were targets of Soviet aggression, uh, something they had no control over, um, and, and only the, the most foolish school kid growing up in the in the 1950s actually believed that ducking under your desk and covering your head would save you from being annihilated if indeed the 
those dastardly commies launched a, a missile on top of your school, on top of your innocent school, uh, because they were just hateful um, and, and mean. So boomers grew up uh, living in fear of nuclear annihilation. Um, I, I, don't, I don't encourage you to do this because I think the, the sources are a little bit slim yet, but uh, uh, some of my um, students in more advanced classes, uh, particularly history majors, um, I encourage to uh, look at and write papers on the civil defense movement of the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, the digging of your own personal uh, nuclear um, uh, shelter uh, is, is uh, and, and fallout shelters are, are uh, just a sign of the times of the fear of nuclear annihilation. Uh, and then we have to look at uh, the influence of, or we have to consider at least because we're not really gonna look at it, the um, uh, influence of affluence. That is, because uh, um, of the prosperity of the era, the middle class grew by leaps and bounds um, in the United States. And this allowed this generation of baby boomers and people associated with them to have first the luxury to not worry about where the next meal was coming from. And so they... Um, uh, they weren't children of the Depression, and they weren't concerned so much about economics as they were concerned about um, um, the, the righteous life, the authentic life, and how you lived a moral and ethical life. Um, that sounds a little namby-pamby, but even, even um, uh, crazed killers like Charles Manson talked in those terms. Um, he just thought that the righteous life included killing the pigs. So you know, even if those pigs were human beings who hadn't done anything to them except be rich. Um, and nevertheless, um, uh, these activists in the 1960s were, had the luxury, you might say, of, um, of seeking something in life besides uh, secure economics. And they, they wanted equality however they defined it, they, they, uh, and a lot of this was murky because a lot of these people were still really young kids. Um, uh, and, and, and the prosperity of the era really allowed uh, for them to seek something else. One of the things that they found we call the new left. Uh, the new left uh, uh, emerged from the, the peace movement that had been squelched by World War II, but had revived in the post-war era with nuclear proliferation. It began um, as anti-nukes, particularly in England and spread to the United States, um, where some of the old 1930s radicals um, joined together to promote, during this period of prosperity, um, not economic unionism, but political trade unionism uh, in favor of industrial democracy. So we see not only the, uh, the new left emerging out of the revived peace movement, but particularly out of the 1950s League for Industrial Democracy, uh, which was a middle class, liberal, not revolutionary organization seeking to spread the concept of democracy from the voting booth into the workplace. Um, the, the League was kind of moribund until it was revived by um, uh, one of its members, Michael Harrington, who uncovered and, and publicized poverty in his book, The Other America, which not only talked about inner cities, but talked in particular about poverty in Appalachia. Um, he influenced uh, Kennedy's war on poverty, uh, The Other America, and Harrington influenced Johnson's war on poverty. But as a member of the League for Industrial Democracy, Harrington's energy led to the League becoming a forum for labor rights and for intellectuals. And it spawned a college wing in 1960 called Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS. Now, SDS was taken over by student radicals in 1961, particularly Tom Hayden, who went on to marry Jane Fonda, and then uh, he had a career in Congress in California, and Al Haber, 
H-A-B-E-R. Um, these, these two guys in particular seize this kind of low impact college wing of uh, the League for Industrial Democracy, gave it some, some, uh, a substantially more radical flavor, uh, particularly youth radicalism of the time, and spread it with their energy, with their contacts, and using the right techniques at exactly the right time, spread SDS chapters across college campuses in the 1960s and even into high school. So what did the Students for Democratic Society want? And in fact, it's uh, Students for Democratic Society um, are, is just one organization of the new left. There were many people in the, in the new left who uh, did not consider themselves to, uh, to be members of SDS and who did not join SDS. But, but at the height that we're looking at it, it's hard to separate um, uh, SDS, the organization, from the new left. These two were so tightly merged. SDS tended to be the focal point for new left politics. Now, the older left had been an industrial left, um, talking about um, uh, manufacturing industries and the rights of workers within manufacturing, and uh, sometimes a socialist vision of, um, of, of um, state-owned or heavy state regulation of corporations uh, in favor of the workers. But the new left was different. It, it's much more of a, an old progressive era mentality in which there is another group outside of that um, uh, Marxist dualism of workers versus capital that have other interests and in the era of prosperity can express those interests. Um, and that's what the new left felt like its focus should be upon, was that group, really middle-class folks, um, who had enough money to be able to think about that different life, as I've said before. Uh, they were kind of the, 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 the new left, and particularly the, the Students for Democratic Society, um, were much more interested in um, uh, not the, 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 the way industrial capitalism worked, because they felt themselves, I think they would say now, as being a post-industrial um, movement. Um, and, and so a lot of the older concepts did not necessarily apply to them. So what was their vision, both the new left and SDS? Well, it was a fairly radical vision for America and for American politics. And it was laid out in the Port Huron Statement of 1962 um, that decried the military industrial academic complex. And, and these three groups were very tightly connected uh, in, in the early 1960s. Um, they, they were really concerned that this military industrial academic complex uh, pushed a militant national security state that was at odds with anything but national security. Uh, they believed that um, the liberal, the post-World War II ideology of establishment liberalism, that is um, the, the uh, conveyor belt between the Ivy League schools and the um, power brokers in New York and Washington, then uh, being the capital E establishment, uh, had failed and did not provide the good life uh, for very many people. And what they really wanted, and, and the way they defined the good life, these uh, student radicals, was uh, in the form of participatory democracy. That is, not just going to the polls and voting for one establishment candidate who calls themselves a Democrat or an establishment candidate who calls themselves a Republican, but participating in democracy day by day, moment by moment. Um, if you've watched at all the Occupy movement, you see um, a revival of that kind of participatory democracy that was molded or, or, or was molded by SDS. Um, they believed that democracy was more than just voting, and it it um, uh, occurred on a personal level as well. Um, Abby Hoffman expressed this in his 1968 book, "Steal This Book," 
by saying that the ground on which you stand is liberated ground. Um, and, and that's a statement of participatory democracy. Um, anyway, they, um, um, uh, the, the Students for Democratic Society got a big push in the fall of 1964 when uh, people like Mario Salvio, uh, who had been part of Freedom Summer of 1964, had gone off from Berkeley to uh, work in Mississippi and had returned to Berkeley, uh, and saw that free speech was as squelched on the Berkeley campus as it was in Mississippi, at least that's what Salvio thought. And so he began uh, what's called the free speech movement. And this galvanized, this, this gave a, uh, the first conflict that SDS could actively participate in and could be mimicked across the face of universities uh, across the United States. Um, it, it gave SDS uh, a, a program, a project that galvanized it and, and was successful in many cases. And so built numbers, students could, could see that they could be successful. Uh, there were even more links with the civil rights movement. Again, um, there were some indirect links and uh, uh, the new left shared uh, similar goals of transforming US society. Um, and then there were direct links uh, like I said, with uh, some of the people who went into SDS having emerged from Freedom Summer, others who worked with SDS uh, also worked with ongoing civil rights initiatives, um, worked with the TAPs, CAPs, the Community Action Programs of the uh, War on Poverty. Um, uh, they worked together, civil rights workers and, um, uh, and students for democratic society worked to elect uh, Johnson over Goldwater in the 1964 presidential campaign, um, and again, this free speech movement, uh, which went on in civil rights and in, um, uh, and in uh, student rights, you might say, with the new left. Okay, this is just a, a bird's eye view of the new left. Uh, it merged with the anti-war movement. Um, eventually, you'll see the new left, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement all merging together. So again, this ends our lecture. And as usual, thank you very much. <laughs>